Good morning, everyone, and welcome to One Million Cups. My name is Milton Jeffrey. I'm one of the organizers here. I want to welcome you all. Introduce you to some of the other organizers. We've got Britton, Brian, Courtney, and Toby. I want to welcome you all today. Um, for those of you that are visiting for the first time, let's see your hands. All right, welcome. Seems like the rest of you are all veterans, right? Well, for those of you here for the first time, um, what One Million Cups is, is an entrepreneurial program uh, led by Kaufman Foundation. And essentially what we do is we have two presenters typically uh, would come and tell their story for about six minutes and then it's followed by about 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, in that time, we ask uh, that you guys participate with us. It starts with our panel and we'll also allow you to kind of raise your hand and we'll come around to you uh, with the microphone, let you ask some questions. Uh, each week we have an expert panel, and today I'd like our panelists to just kind of stand up, say hello, and introduce themselves. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Kopakin. Uh, I guess at my core, I'm a businessman, and I'm now a uh, business attorney who applies that knowledge to my clients' needs to help them grow and maximize profit while reducing risk. Glad to be here. Hi, my name is Sarah Shipley. I'm a... Um well, I do startups, and I also work for Casey Healthy Kids. Thank you. Well, we want to go ahead and get things started. We're going to bring up our first presenters from Grass-Fed Beef Crisps, Paul Schwenson and Davis Graves. Well, good morning. We're going to talk about the most interesting topic on the entire planet, and that is beef jerky, right? We humbly submit that this beef jerky here is actually going to help save the world, however. A um, little bit about our backstory. How in the world did I get to be standing in a gritty parking lot in Phoenix peddling beef jerky, one might ask? And the answer, as usual, is a, it's a long story, but I started out in the livestock industry, as, as, uh, born on the Navajo Reservation. Family traveled through South, uh, on, through South America on the way to South Africa, spent four sunny and lovely years in the, in the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, traveled through the Far East, through Hong Kong and Taiwan on our way back to the United States, spent two not so sunny years in the Pacific Northwest, got our head screwed back on straight, came back to Arizona to the family ranch out there. And for some reason we decided as a family to take a one year jaunt out to Kashmir, Pakistan. So we, we traveled by red line out to the Indian subcontinent, uh, experimented with public transportation, lived to tell about it, came back to Back to the States, back to ranching in Arizona. Um, I decided at some point I'd better go to college, so I looked for a fun party school at the U.S. Air Force Academy. <laughs> Did not find it there. <laughs> uh, after graduation, traveled through, through uh, South America again on, on a scenic tour to my first duty assignment. Came through Africa and Europe on the way back to Florida. Intended to fly one of these, uh, but my eyes would not cooperate. I ended up flying one of these instead. So. Came back to Arizona once again, had a hankering for graduate school, enrolled at Harvard. The Air Force very kindly sent me on a one-way, all-expense-paid tour to Afghanistan. Did my time there. Came back to the States, finally got out of the Air Force, out of the service, and rejoined the family ranching operation where I'd wanted to be all along, which the livestock thought was hilarious. And I turned down a very swank job with the U.S. State Department in order to pedal jerky in a gritty parking lot in Phoenix, right? My story begins not on a ranch, but in the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona, where I was the youngest member of Boot Hill, the Graves family band. My dad was an airline pilot, so I did a lot of travel, saw a lot of beautiful places, and as a budding photographer, thought I was going to grow up and be Ansel Adams. I did pretty well in high school, graduated with 40, 43 college credits, uh, finished Calc 3 before college, so I thought I'd do physics. I thought it sounded pretty fun. Realized pretty quickly on the first semester that I wanted to maintain somewhat of a life, so I switched into the nation's first school of sustainability at ASU. I was still doing photography and graphic design at the time and volunteered my services for uh, an entrepreneur's event where I was introduced to the serial entrepreneur. So I thought economics would be a great minor to take up. So now pursuing sustainable business, I went on a, on a group project. I went out to Paul, Paul's uh, family ranch out in Winkleman, Arizona, and luckily for him, I'd ridden a horse a week earlier and wanted to become a cowboy. So I went out to his ranch, stayed for a week, fixed a fence, got bit by a hog, and designed the very first mock-up of grass-fed beef crisps. 
So our product is designed to solve two main problems. The first problem is that almost all mainstream meat products suck. The second problem is that family farms and ranches are disappearing at the rate of about one every hour, and I'm not making that up. So in true entrepreneurial fashion, we take these two problems and turn them into one solution. So this is our solution. This is a, you know, this is rocket science. This is our product that actually tastes good and is actually healthy for you, and it helps to pay a premium to the very producers and land stewards that we're trying to keep on the landscape. So we have this bioregional sourcing model, and we're growing outward. Uh, the idea is to ultimately have a bag of beef crisp anywhere in the country that has a verifiable pedigree clear back to the landscape from which it came. Everybody knows where the beef came from, and they're supporting family ranches in that particular region. So our timing couldn't be better. The market for meat snacks is worth two and a half billion dollars and it's been growing rapidly, more than twice as fast as other snack food categories. And luckily for us, it's a very protein dense product and consumers clearly buying their snacks based on protein content, we're in a pretty good place. So we've got a great idea and we have a proven market, so how do we get there? Our first step was finding local ranchers who would uphold our strict sourcing standards for grass fed and humane treatment of the animals. Next, we had to design the label and submit it to USDA and back up every single claim that we make on the label and hope that the inspector looking through our application agrees with the interpretation we made on the regulations, same as his uh, counterpart sitting next to him. And, and Davis, as usual, is being charitable. I cannot impart to you how, what an impossible headache it is to get through the bureaucratic system of USDA label approval for a good, healthy, wholesome product. But nevertheless, we, we <laughs> did it, we survived, and we're here to tell the story. So with label happily in hand, we had to move into commercial production at a USDA inspected facility, manage their quality um, and inventory flow. A lot went into to getting everybody dialed on the, on the production side. Then we had to find retailers, get the product on the shelf and in consumers' hands, and in the background figure out all the shipping, logistics, and distribution that goes into getting it from point A to point B. This is sort of an understatement. So most entrepreneurs love the idea of being a having the first mover advantage, and we ourselves believed that about six and a half years ago. Uh, unfortunately, as, as most of businessmen can attest, it's not as easy as it looks, and you know, we find ourselves today in this veritable constellation of brand new beef products that are coming out every day. It's, it's, a, it's a, as David said, a growing industry. It's vibrant, it's big. Um, nevertheless, we're not disheartened by that. We think that our product despite not being the first of the sort of artisan level beef jerkies out on the shelf, still stays very strong because it's so different. It's, it's very thin, very dry, very crispy. It's physically different than, than the competition. It's not the wrestle in your mouth kind of stuff. Um, it's simplicity, you know, its ingredients are very, very simple. This product right here has, has a grand total of two ingredients and our other line has a grand total of three. Most jerky has 17 to 27 ingredients per bag. So we think that's, you know, all these things help us ultimately it tastes phenomenal because the beef itself is doing, the, doing the, the talking. And again, it's supporting local and regional farmers and ranchers, which we think a lot of customers really would like to have their food dollars doing something good for the world. So where we are today, uh, we, we are currently in, in about 50 retail locations in six states, mostly in the west. We started in Arizona and we're growing outward from there. Um, we've also found the online sale through Amazon.com as well as our own website have been surprisingly robust. Uh, that was a bit of a surprise to us and we're hoping to see that grow. And the reason we're in Kansas City, you might ask, is because literally last week we signed our first purchase order with Natural Grocers, which triples us overnight. I mean, it's unbelievable when you get a, a blue chip client like that, they can, they can really quantum leap you into the future. And so we're now, as, as, of, as of this very moment, we're now in 15 states and nearly 150 locations. Uh, we're at the Sundry right down the street um, and growing fast. So it's exciting, exciting place to be. We're kind of growing out of that startup and into, into the main, main line. So where we're headed, uh, it is our goal to try to hit 15,000 units a month. We're currently at 3,000, uh, so we basically need to quintuple our size. That's the challenge. We have all those different ways of doing it. Um, and that's where, we, that's where we expect to go. We can go into that later in the, in the Q&A. So in summary, if you want to buy jerky that doesn't suck and help keep family ranchers on the land, check us out online at beefcrisps.com and buy a bag. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to uh, open it up to our panelists to start with the questions before we involve the audience. Uh, that was 
the most interesting backstory I've ever heard. That was great for both of you. So can you tell me a bit about your price point compared to your other peer products? Yeah, so our price point is about $7. And other jerkies are pretty comparable, about 6 or 7 typically for a bag of jerky. The only caveat there is that our product is, is a lighter weight um, in, the, in the package unit and that's because we dry out the water weight. So we have 19 grams of protein per ounce versus more like nine grams of protein per ounce in a regular jerky. So we are giving the customer more value, we think, for a smaller package size, similar price, but with a slight premium. It's a difficult challenge. We'd love to get your advice, the audience's advice on this, because we have a marketing challenge in which we must make the, the business case to somebody in the blink of an eye that for seven bucks, that they're getting more for their money by buying a one ounce package of this ultra thin, ultra dry stuff, as opposed to three and a half ounces of the really wet, chewy stuff. Because people are basically buying water with mainstream jerky, that's really what they're doing. So I know you guys want to uh, source it locally. As you grow and as your regions change, is that a challenge when looking at profit margin, let alone establishing the relationships you know, in regions that you guys are not familiar with? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a big challenge. We, um, we, we've, we've done it already, so I know that it can be done. Uh, we've we've uh, added the, the northern tier bioregion of Montana, and so, so we know it can be done. It's actually, if you come from ranching, it's actually kind of a small community. I mean, you may not know somebody directly in ranching in, say, Nebraska, but it doesn't take long to find somebody who does know somebody, and so and we can really capitalize that, that, uh, that network, the ranching network. Um, so it hasn't been as difficult as we thought, but it's clearly a challenge. For sure. I, I had one more question. What, what current marketing efforts or campaigns are you guys undertaking? Not too much currently. Most of our um, interest has been from grassroots efforts. So Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, where our customers are sharing the product. We have a lot of uh, really devoted fans who are buying 25, 50 bags at a time online, and they're posting photos and sharing it with friends. And then in the stores, we're working, in Arizona, we have all, all the Sprouts locations, so we're going in and doing demos in the store, talking to customers and getting it in their mouth, because it's really a matter of tasting it to understand what makes, what makes ours different. And pretty much when this is sitting on the shelf, it has to communicate everything that's inside the bag without them being able to taste it. So we're doing our best for those customers who don't get to come to a demo, um, like we say dried from a quarter pound of grass-fed beef, to try to indicate how much protein is actually in there that we're starting with um, compared to a regular bag. To dovetail off that, do you have a specific, tell me about your demographic. Yeah, we, we actually have a slide buried in there somewhere. Uh, we're still pulling it out, to be perfectly frank. I mean, we, have, we, can, we can say the numbers is 18, 30 to five, you know, 18 years to 35 years old and so forth. Um, but it, but it, seems to, it seems to be splash all over the board. I mean, the, the, the one of the key attributes of our demographic, I think, is the, what I like to call the local or the conscientious consumer demographic. I mean, this is not really going to appeal to, you know, the NASCAR and Cheetos set. That's just how it is. You know, we know that. Um, and, and so I think our, our demographic is more socioeconomic than it is necessarily, you know, gender or age. And one of the cool things I think about the product is that because our, our actual texture and, and the product characteristics are so different, we have a lot of customers who aren't jerky customers to begin with. So we're kind of reaching into other realms. I have one last thing because the marketing background in me is just jumping out. Um, work on a phrase, in my opinion, uh, to get away from drier. I think that sometimes is an unappetizing word. I know it's crunchier. You know, I haven't tried your product. I know it's different. But drier to me means I better have a glass of water next to me. But yeah. how about, you guys did so well. I had to critique you on something. How, how about they taste great, less wet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Thin, thin cut artisan beef jerky is one of the ones that we, we have right now. Trying to, to focus on thin and crispy when we talk about it in our marketing materials. Yeah. We've got a question for you here up front. So it would be nice if um, you could tell us what the two or three ingredients are. Um, another part of my question has to do with your, I think, seven regions that you plan to source from. So the bags will actually identify the regions they come from, I'm assuming. Um, and then it goes, ties back to the marketing questions my panel asked. In other words, um, you don't call the product jerky except as a subtitle. 
So you're trying to stay away from jerky, and yet through your entire presentation, you called it jerky. So in your marketing, how do you differentiate yourself and, and make yourself better? You, you, you've said a lot of things in a lot of words, but uh, just with the quick glance at your packaging uh, or your uh, store uh, retails um, displays, I didn't see a lot that makes you stand out. Okay. Um, I think it's a lot of different pieces of that question. <laughs> the ingredients, yeah. Um, so this particular one, smoked sea salt, literally has beef and smoked sea salt. We also have one with the, that has black pepper. So grass-fed beef and black pepper. Yeah. So no, no preservatives or anything. It's dried. It's preserved through the art of drying. Um, what were the other pieces of that question? Can you so as far as shout out, it's okay. What was the last part of that? Oh, so when we first started this, why we why we just have jerky in one spot on the package? Our our initial metaphor was we we're going to do to the jerky market what Cliff Bar did to granola bars. So we tried to separate ourselves from the jerky and position us more um, in a similar category. And for the regions, this is just a rough draft right now of where we might spread to. Um, we're only really, we're, we're mostly focused on Arizona right now, which we're gonna be expanding to the greater Southwest. And but, we all, other, but we actually do, but we're moving in the Northern Plains region as well. We have contacts there and we have, we have Montana made, or, or Montana beef on the shelves in Montana at the moment too. Um, so we do it, intend to grow into this. We know it can be done. And then go back to your differentiation thing, because I think it's a big deal. I mean, it's a very big deal for us. And so we think that you know, this, this on a typical jerky rack, unfortunately, you, know, you get categorized, right? It, and we keep saying jerky, I know what you mean. We call, it, we call it crisps, but you can't go to a mainline distributor and say, hey, we sell crisps. You know, they want to know what category. Are you in the dried meat snacks category? And we are. And so on a, on a rack of typical dried meat snacks, this stands out because this is very subtle packaging. It's very wholesome looking packaging. There's no glossy red, neon yellows. It's, you know, the idea is to tone it down and stand out by being toned down. Got a question here in the middle. Hi guys, just one, I was one, it was, your presentation was very intriguing to say the least. And also I'm pleased that you said, that you mentioned Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter that you're using as key social media platforms. Um, can you describe the challenges that you face with building a strategy involving all three of those platforms? and some of your successes. Yeah, it's, it's definitely tricky to, to post to all three. What we've been doing recently is, is an Instagram photo post, because photos tend to perform very well, and linking those, you know, posting it to both Facebook and Twitter. Um, I've started trying to do Twitter as a separate one so we can keep the photographs on there. Um, Instagram has been probably the, the most successful for us in customers posting their own photos of it on a road trip or or um, you know, just enjoying you know their monthly shipment of beef crisps. You have a question over here. Mm -hmm. You guys actively looking um, for for suppliers um, in the Central Plains region right now? It's it's a little premature, but I, we're we're looking for contacts. I couldn't say that we're we're going to come with checkbook in hand at this very moment, but it sounds like you might have a lead, and we're always open to. Because we're we're moving here. now that now that we have this this uh, blue chip client, we'd love to see you know our our central our Midwest sourcing bioregion on the bags that are currently in natural grocers right here in Olathe, Shawnee, Independence, um, and, and Overland Park. Park. Central, yeah, Central Missouri. Yeah, right. That's, okay. That, that, that's our intent. So find yes. me when you're done. Yes, we will. <laughs> Got another question here for you. Yep. Hi, I agree. Marketing, it's great to stand out, but. Is there a point where you could stand out too much and be too different? For example, um, um, you know, why grass-fed instead of the word organic? And I know you, you have to go through more government approval for organic. And then why crisp instead of beef chips? And um, one last question is um, why not show the product with a clear plastic like some of the jerkies do or at least a picture of the product on the bag. So they get a, cause I, you know, I really didn't get a clear concept of what your product was until you showed the picture of it. And I thought that was great. Um, and it looked appealing. Uh, and you guys do have a great product, product. your presentation's great. Um, I think though too, um, you, you need to help 
a little bit in defining how your marketing is going to really pro propel you. No, that's a great question. Every one of those questions, you know, is 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 a, is, is the result of a, a giant wrestling match that we've had. We've gone through those things back and forth and back. Still do. Uh, you know, the one that struck me most in interestingly was the clear plastic window because it's funny how, how marketing, you, you find yourself just doing what everybody does in a particular sector. Jerky, for some reason, somewhere probably in 1978, decided that clear windows was the thing. Frankly, jerky doesn't look all that appealing in a bag by itself. We just, I, I, you know, I unilaterally decided this, and ours doesn't really look amazingly good. It really doesn't. You know, what we try to do is say, we have a deeper story here and it's hidden in the bag. You know, it, this is, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna give it to you. The pictures that Davis does is showing the, the spread out crisps. People can find that if they need, if they're really worried about what it looks like. Um, but it, you know, it might have been the wrong call. We don't know. We may go with the plastic window some, some other day. There were some <laughs> other things she had. Do you want to hit those? Well, did, you, did you have another nuance there that you wanted uh, some feedback on? Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the grass fed versus organic. This might be a better one for Paul since he's the rancher, but organics is a really, really tough certification for family scale ranchers. Um, and it's not always grass fed and you know up to the standards that we're looking for. So we're trying to work with those family ranchers who are doing uh, the things that we believe are, are best on the land. The, yeah, there are a lot of organic jerkies. Some of them are grass fed and usually those are they're different claims. <laughs> I have a question over here to your left. Good morning. So I'm interested in your production process. I'm assuming it all, does it all happen in Arizona? And what are the sort of challenges you've had in terms of logistics, like thinking about all of these different regions and raw beef being transported? And I don't know about how much that costs or if it's more, if it's raw, or what sort of challenges have you had and how do you expect to handle all this uh, rapid growth? Yeah, we, we've wrestled with all those as well, and we're, we're not set on one particular path. We're producing right now out of Phoenix, Arizona, and getting that facility lined up to scale, and they're doing, they work with some other tricky clients as well, so they're building a lot of capacity that we're hoping to tap into. So it's gonna be a matter of, of whether or not the cost of transporting the beef um, is gonna make more sense when the facility is, is dialed for our product, because we do have a very unique production process to make it thin and crispy like that. We also have we, a Montana, Montana processor as well, so we know how to work with other processors. It's not easy, and there's the tendency to want to centralize all your production in one place because you get the best you know, economies of scale and so forth. But you also leave yourself really vulnerable if that one processor, and it happens all the time, if they go under or they get, you know, they get dinged by the USDA for an infraction or something. So we, we're trying to stay less than one deep at every stage of our logistics chain because we, we know that we could learn the lesson the hard way. It's more the consistency on the processing side, because we think that different regions with different grass-fed beef and different terroir is really exciting when it tastes a little bit different and you know it's coming from the beef. Getting the thinness and crispiness um, and the right you know, level of dryness on the product is where we, we just have to test each batch. We go in and, and monitor the process and make sure it's you know, each week it's coming out the way it should. Question here in the middle. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, so what's going through my mind is I want to taste it. And so <laughs> I'm sitting yeah. here thinking, have you ever explored with um, some type of a free premium, a smaller package, maybe two chips in an envelope you could give to your suppliers? Because until you, unless you get into Trader Joe's where I can go and I can buy and if I don't like it, then I can return, turn it back $7, no problem. But if I were to go to a register, it was there, it was free, I tasted, opened it up, mm, where's this? Right. Sale. The other thing that i like to share, um, fortunately I'm in a growing population of, I'm, I'm, I'm growing older and I'm aging. I've also been a vegetarian most of my life, but as I mature, my, I'm listening to my body and I desire more protein. And so what I've decided, I, I eat a steak once a month. Once a month, go to a nice re restaurant, get a ribeye. I would prefer not to do that. This might be something that would appeal to me as someone who is maturing in age and responding to the needs for protein in my body. 
Yeah, no, that's that's great feedback. And you know, my core company, which is a, which is a standard beef company, we supply raw beef. Not this. This is almost a spin-off of my core company. Um, you know, we we joke that you know a quarter of our clientele are recovering vegetarians in one form or another. And so, and we we truly believe that this product will be a gateway drug. In effect, <laughs> that it will it will probably appeal to vegetarian or or you know less carnivorous folks. I really. Do. Got another question here in the middle. Morning. Uh, I work for a organic sustainable butcher shop and restaurant that serves exclusively grass-fed beef. So I'm working with grass-fed beef. I understand. I love how you guys are playing on, you know, consistently good in the process, but understanding that the terroir is going to be the flavor of the beef. So when you play on the local regions, it's it's cool that you're playing on that as an advantage rather than you know a concern. Um, if you're looking for another market, uh, um, I can get you in contact with a local grass-fed ranch here in Missouri if you want to start getting products from the local area and uh, possibly feature your, rest, uh, your product at uh, the restaurant too uh, if you want to get in contact. Um, one question I have is, have you tried getting a, uh, the non-GMO verified project stamp for your product as a way to separate yourself from the rest? I'll start with the last one. Go ahead. <laughs> Looked at it briefly. Uh, nothing has come of it yet, but we we're still, you know, it's still on the table. We are one percent for the planet, uh, which we think does similar things from a marketing perspective. It it, it indicates, you know, a, a corporate ethic, I suppose, is the best way to put it. Um, but we are looking at the non-GMO product or uh, uh, certification. It's a little complicated, um, but yeah, we may go there. And please come talk to us afterwards. Yeah, indeed. And really love to meet you. <laughs> Got one more here in the middle in the back. What is the wholesale price, the shelf life, and minimum order for a wholesaler? So we are doing a minimum order basically of just one case each. So a case is 10 units. Our shelf life is 12 months. So it lasts you know, a year. It's really shelf stable. And then our, our wholesale information, if you're in the, in the industry, we can give you the uh, our wholesale term sheet, if you'd like. <laughs> but fairly standard, though, for retail margins. Yeah, in short, 515, one year, and about two cases. One more quick question. Good morning. My name is Holmes. I was born. I have a <clears throat> comment that kind of dovetails on the guy who's sitting in the middle. Um, if memory serves me correctly, Texas is the number one beef state in the country, and Missouri is number two. However, because Texas is about five times the size of Missouri, really, we're number one. and <laughs> but but who's counting? <laughs> but we're number one in beef, and I, I know enough about beef to be dangerous because I grew up in a little town. One head of cattle per three acres. What is it in Arizona? Is it one head of cattle per 30 acres? Not even close, 300. 300 acres? <laughs> yeah. Okay. We, we run 300 head on 10,000 acres. Right, okay. So here, we still have little bitty ranchers, you know, and, and there's a lot of opportunity to for you to... Uh, Get your grass-fed beef. It's it's a good. It's still a good cattle state. Even in the city limits of Kansas City, people still run cattle. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. And our uh, last patented question is: What can we, as a this room full of uh, this community, help do to help you? Funny you should ask. We happen to have a slide. <laughs> so go to our website. Buy a bag. That'd be a really great way to help us out or go to your local Vitamin Cottage Natural Grocers or the Sundry. Spread the word. We have our social media handles there. So like us, tell your friends about it. If anybody you think might be interested, let them know what we do. And then if anybody is connected within retail, wholesale, or some other interesting channel like a winery that wants to do pairings, a health or fitness expert, a periodical for an article or something, please get in touch with us. If you don't come up and talk to us, our emails are down at the bottom. I'm Davis, and this is Paul. And we will be sampling in the back uh, when it's all over, so come, come by and say hello and try some. Thank you very much. Great. Right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, if you haven't already, there's uh, announcement sheets in the back and around. Uh, it tells you a little bit about the presenters and uh, then the second thing we're doing today. Um, and there are some announcements on the back of that, but I'm gonna trust that you can read 
and you take a look at those because there's some great events going on. Uh, first, we're going to have, we have two announcements from different folks here, and this is Katie Baker about One Week KC. Thank you. Good morning. Um, hopefully by now you guys have all gone to the back of the room and picked up this flyer. I don't see any. Oh, good. A couple of you. Thank you. There's plenty for you guys to take like two or three, put one on your fridge, put it in the visor in your car. Um, remind yourself of all of the really cool things that are happening during One Week KC. In particular, I want to point out Tuesday, June 2nd, E-Day at the K. This is a very cool opportunity, you guys, to not only attend a Royals game with some of your closest friends, like 400 of them, but also... Um, we're going to have a panel with some expert entrepreneurs, um, all-stars, if you will, um, that starts at 4 o'clock. We'll have a dinner buffet at 5.30, and then the game at 7 o'clock. So make sure you buy your ticket. Um, tickets are just $20. It's royals.com slash eday. So hope to see you guys all there. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Kitty. That's a great event. And then we have Amanda with Founder School. Hello guys, um, I'm Amanda Sneeders with the entrepreneurship team at Kaufman and just want to let you guys know we've been releasing a new series on Founder School, our free online um, curriculum platform for entrepreneurs to learn just-in-time lessons in a variety of topics, but our recent series is on, is our first kind of venture into financing your venture inside venture capital with um, Jeff Busking of Flybridge Capital Partners out of Boston. So it talks about anything from how you should research the right firm that you would want to seek funding from to how do you impress an investor to how do you negotiate a deal. Um, so you guys should check it out. And like I said, it's just our first kind of waylay into financing your venture. We'd like to move beyond this into other forms as far as angel investment, bootstrapping, um, and even maybe some crowdfunding. But um, we'll let you guys take a look at this, and hopefully you can check it out. We've got a handful of videos up there, and we've got about three more to release over the next couple weeks. Before I became a VC, I used to be an entrepreneur. I co-founded a company called You Promise, whose mission was to help families save money for college. We raised over $100 million, and we helped families save $35 billion towards college tuition. Before that, I was an executive at an internet commerce software company called Open Market. We went public in the mid-90s and had a peak market capitalization of over $2 billion. Both of the companies that I was involved with were backed by venture capitalists, some of the best in the world, and I learned a tremendous amount from them. When I became a VC myself, I wanted to provide a lot of those lessons, the lessons that I learned as a startup entrepreneur, to new entrepreneurs and help them avoid the mistakes that I made, and there were many. I'm Jeff Buskang, general partner at Flybridge Capital. In addition to my work at Flybridge Capital, I also teach a class at Harvard Business School called Launching Technology Ventures. In my class are students who either want to start their own companies or join the next hot startup. And I try to help them with the practical tools on how to launch their technology ventures. The reason I love startups is I love working with people and seeing them grow. I love taking early ideas from the very beginning and seeing them become massive market opportunities and massively disruptive forces in an industry. All the resources you can imagine are at your disposal to help accelerate what you're trying to do. All right, so this is a little bit of a shift, a little bit different, something different for the uh, second half of the program. Sarah and Stu, come on up. Um, <laughs> we're gonna have, I'm gonna have them introduce themselves here in just a second. We're calling this uh, segment just sort of a uh, moderated discussion. I'm gonna have these guys talk a little bit about some of the tough decisions that they've faced. Um, these are both uh, One Million Cups alumni. And I, as we were, have been kicking around different ideas of things to do, um, one of the things that I love about One Million Cups is that even though everybody here has different ideas, uh, works for different types of startups or has, they want to do a startup, there, there's a common path. And I think that one of, the, one of the common things I always ask people about is what was your aha moment where you're driving down the road and you realize there's got to be a better way and then you launch into your idea. Um, I think the myth is that once you have your aha moment, then 
the pathway towards success is clear and everybody just keeps following that and then you're good, right? Is that how, that, that how it works? It's really that easy. Yeah, it is that easy. So, uh, as we all know, there, along the way, there's a lot of tough decisions to make. And um, this, these are two examples of two different types of um, people and different types of situations that they've had to go through. So, if you guys could just do a quick intro to, um, of yourselves and the, what organization you presented here, uh, and then we'll get into kind of the, the different avenues of tough decisions that you've, that you've gone through. Presented here, I think on two different occasions, um, for a bike walk KC and Kansas City B Cycle, I rode a bike up this stage, which was tons of fun. I was a co-founder of Neighborly as well, when Neighborly, Neighborly 1.0, um, they are opposed uh, to totally disrupt the financial industry. And B Cycle and Bike Walk KC, they are completely disrupting the transportation industry. So what was the other question? <laughs> that's it. That's it, all right. <laughs> so that's my history at Kaufman. And I'm Stuart Ludlow. My company's RFP365. We have a software platform that helps facilitate the request for proposal process. And I've also been up here twice. Uh, the first time was in uh, October of 2013. And then about a month ago or five weeks ago, I was also up here. So I'm not sure if my face looks familiar. That's why. There's other reasons why you might be familiar. Around town, quite a bit. You ever watch Days of Our Lives? Right. There's that too. So uh, I'm going to start with Sarah for, uh, at first. Um, you've recently had in the last year or so, now you're with KC Healthy Kids. Yes. Some changes. So the, uh, just, if you could talk a little bit just about the process of being a co-founder mm -hmm. and then deciding when, at what point it's time to step away, take a break, do something else, change direction, that kind of thing. It's a huge, I mean, that's, that's a lot to answer, right? When do you step away as a co-founder? And you step away when it's ready to thrive. I was trying to think about the best, best way to describe this. And so here's, this is, this is what I came up with. How many of you um, have kids or have taught someone how to ride a bike? Anyone? All right, so, so there's a few people there. There's this moment when you're teaching your child how to ride a bike and you're running with them down the sidewalk and your hands on the back of the seat and you, you let go and they, they wobble and then they just go. And that's the moment you realize as a co-founder, you're not needed anymore. Because the, the, the organization isn't about you, it's about, it's about what's going to happen after you left and making sure it's sustainable. And so with Bike Walk KC, I love that organization and I love taking it through startup phase, but I am not someone who's a maintainer, I'm a starter. And so as soon as it got to the maintenance stage, I was able to run alongside, let go of the seat and well, do something else. So earlier in your career, leave it on, earlier in your career, were there times where you were still trying to hang on to that bike seat and it didn't work? Like yes. You were still trying to, that, that takes a lot of self-knowledge, like knowing I'm a starter and once it gets to this point, then I need to step away. So is there a point at which you're, were there some decision points where you were just trying to figure that out. Sure. So I had, we had as an organization some fundraising targets that needed to be, to be met, and I would not leave in the, until those were met. That was very um, significant. Another thing is having the staff that can do the job. I mean, once everyone's uh, organization is staffed up, it's ready to go. The, uh, another big, huge decision point was all the little things, and I don't know if, if a lot of you founders have found, have found this, but things just start to add up. So um, is the organization funded? Is it ready to go? Does it have the right staff? Is it going, does it have a, a five-year plan? Does it have a three-year plan? If all that, if that stack is much higher than, than the, the, well, the other one, then it, it's time to leave. There's, um, and it's also very important as a founder or a co-founder to do significant ego checks. How many founders are in the room here? It's important to, Check your ego all the time to make sure it's not about you, but it's about the organization. Awesome. So, Stu, you're in a little bit different situation. How long has RFP365 been around? And just give a little snapshot of what you've gone through over the past, what, has it been six months, a year, to get to the funding? 
So RFP 365 has been around for about two and a half years. I founded it with um, Dave Holson, who was my best friend at the time. Uh, it's not my first company either. It's is he still your He still okay. still is best friend. Uh, I assume some of these things will probably talk about the interpersonal communications and relationships of founders, um, which was a really big deal since this is my third my third official company that I've founded. Uh, my first one doesn't exist anymore as a consulting firm. The second one is another software product and it actually still exists. And this is the third one. So um, to touch on, since I brought it up, since it's a really big deal, it's uh, the the most important thing of getting going was knowing that I had a competent and reliable co-founder that I could lean on and trust. Uh, my first company, uh, I found it with two other guys, and one of them stole money and we kicked, up, kicked him out. I haven't talked to him in 10 years. The second company I, I founded with a family member, and it ended so poorly it broke up half of our family. And so I had had, and then one of those, one other person that had been, had helped me with both of those, and he was phenomenal. One of my most trusted people um, that I've ever known. So I know that the founder that you have in my scenarios has either turned out that person has become more valuable in my life or has completely thrown away everything, uh, all relationship with that person. So as, as I was founding RFP 365, I had all these, I knew Dave was my best friend. I'm like, this is going to either work out in one of two directions. We're either going to go grow closer as friends or something bad's going to happen and I'll never talk to you again. So it was a really big risk uh, and really, really, it weighed on both of our minds quite a bit as to whether or not we even start this venture. The last time you were here, somebody asked you about that and uh, some of the things that you, I guess, have been able to do over the last two, two and a half years just to manage that. Uh, yeah, so, and help, help narrow my focus here, right? So broad questions tend to elicit uh, longer responses That's from cool. me. Um, I don't mind interrupting you. Okay. Um, you know, uh, a founder is no different than a spouse. You're going to spend a lot more time with your co-founder than you are with your spouse um, or family. And so if you look at the dynamics that you have with your spouse of things that you're going to fight, you're going to get upset, you're going to have to make decisions that you disagree on, um, all of those things completely... Uh, translate very equally to a co-founder. And so if you don't have time for communication, if you don't have time for fun, if you don't have time for um, just being around each other, then uh, it's just not gonna work out. Very, very, I mean, the, the, the parallels are very, very strong with for sure. my wife versus Dave. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few aspects that a are A couple different. things that are different. Uh, Sarah, earlier you mentioned um, just being aware of funding goals. Um, so I want each of you to speak a little bit about funding really different scenarios. So you were working, Sarah, in fundraising for, mm -hmm. um, in order to deliver programs and, and, and uh, you know, developing partnerships in order to do that. Um, if you could just speak a little bit to the challenges of that. And then Stu, you've gone through some uh, funding and, and so then just speak a little bit to that process. and. Specifically with the theme today, you know, the tough decisions you have to make as you are navigating all that. Sure. So funding always comes with strings attached. That's just part of life. And when we're doing transportation funding, it's usually a zero-sum game. So it's all or nothing. So you'll get a quarter of a million dollars or you'll get nothing. And then how do you very quickly get your team together to figure out how to spend that money on what is needed most? Money makes things very, very complicated. It's very easy to be a bootstrap startup and really, you know, just work all day long and not have any cash. But once money comes into the picture, you better have a plan for that money. And I would have it sooner rather than later. Very, very good. And then with RFP 365, we, uh, we just raised $950,000. We closed it in March. I'm sorry, we closed it mid-February. Um, and I can't iterate that last statement that you said, Sarah, is that once money comes in the door, things drastically change. Uh, Dave and I had bootstrapped. We'd put in 
We'd each sunk 45 grand into the company, so we had $90,000 of our own money invested, which was good, and we could sustain that for a while. But the second that money came in the door, and we had to start hiring employees, and we had to start um, having board meetings with all of our investors and mapping out our plans and growth strategies, it, everything has changed. Our, the type of customer we want even has to change. The product is naturally changing just to accommodate for the level of growth to which is expected, which is vastly different than a bootstrapped company. For sure. So let's can we open it up to questions from folks if they want to ask uh, about I anything of these guys. Um, Got a question here oh, in the good. middle. Come on, Ben. Give them a good one. This question is for Stuart. You just said that everything changed after you got funded, but you didn't say it got better. <laughs> are, you, are you happy with that decision? And, and how, has it, how has it made things better for you? Ben, I would expect no other question from you. Something thought provoking. It definitely has gotten better. Um, it's, it, different is good and bad. So the level of stress has drastically changed in my life. The level of stress has quadrupled. It was a very stressful time raising the money. And then we had a nice like, moment of, uh, of clarity from once we had the money up until we started using the money. And so now that we're using the money, uh, it, it is just the, the level of stress and the, of the, the number of moving parts is moving. There's more moving parts and each part is moving faster. So the good thing that it's done, we have made our operations a thousand times more sophisticated than they were when we were bootstrapped. We are now using Salesforce as a CRM that's completely integrated to HubSpot as a marketing engine. Uh, we moved everything over to a huge cluster over on AWS for our hosting providers. We have processes that we're putting in place. We have methodologies of talking to customers. We have customer support process. All of these things didn't exist pre-money. We had, it was all two guys just reacting to whatever was happening at the time. And so the part of it is that we're moving really, really fast right now to implement all these new techniques and processes and, and, and tools, which has made things better. So yes, I, I will say in that respect, it is much better. But at the same time, it's just a lot to, it's a lot to juggle. But it's fun. Question back here to your right, against the wall. We'll double down on question. Hey, um, you guys both talked about, you know, trying to, I guess, produce the right individuals to let the bicycle run, I guess, right? The right employees. How'd you go about hiring the right employees, identifying those people, retaining them, and then how did you know if somebody wasn't a fit? That's a very good question. Um, the first thing we did, at, at first you want to keep your hiring, you, as an entrepreneur, as a startup, you want to keep everything within your friends. And that's, and that's, that's your first thought, and that's definitely not what you want to do. Um, you want to look all across the nation and do hiring searches so you can get the best and brightest from everywhere. I, that was probably one of the first mistakes we made, was to, to, to not do that. So that's how we found people, because everyone wants to work for a sexy, fun company like B-Cycle. It's a millennial's dream. So we found the best and the brightest to come work for us. Um, what was the second part? That's it. I don't know what we're doing here, but um, can you tell me what your plan was for the money? I'm really interested. For, for, the, for our... Um, when money came in. Sure. So we, we had very specific plans for the money. We wanted to build and did build um, a B-cycle system all across the Kansas City area. So those rent-a-bike systems that you see everywhere, um, we found federal funding and private funding to match the federal funding to put the B-cycle systems on the ground. And it, it's done. How about you, Stu? And ours was different. We had, the story that I think I've iterated a couple of times was that as a two-man software company, the customers we were getting kept getting larger and larger. And those customers were looking at us as, hey, we love what you've built. It's, it's, it's awesome. But we're not going to use you as a company because you're two guys. And so we, the plan for us, it's one of the reasons why we chose to raise money, was that we, we could mature as an organization to 
um, be able to land larger customers. So our plan was truly headcount. Um, the the headcount, not in terms of just having headcount, but now we can actually go out and market it better and, and sell better and more engineering support. So that way we can give more peace of mind to our larger customers. Question here to your left. So you mentioned, Stu, that your, your customer changed when the money came in the door. Um, I think you just answered that question, like they got bigger or something. Was that, is that true? And is there any way that you can kind of plan like for that new customer when you start out? Because obviously when you start out the business, you're after a particular customer and you're setting up that business based on that particular customer and then everything changes. So I can answer that in two ways. With, in the RFP world, someone issues an RFP and, so on, and then a bunch of vendors respond to it. Our platform can technically accommodate both. Most of our money when we were bootstrapping was coming from those vendors who were responding to an RFP. The grand vision of the platform is to only, to mainly issue RFPs through the platform. And so while we were bootstrapping, we would take any, any account that came through because we needed that revenue even if it was just a couple thousand dollars, it helped us. We now have runway enough to where we can focus upstream. So we don't have to, we don't have to get every single responder. It takes a lot of our emphasis away. So we're, we're moving from this side of the equation to this, which is a, innately a different set of, of customers. And so that's why our customer focus had shift. And even within that customer focus, we've had to drill down very, very, very specifically into a niche market, so that way we can, we still only have two sales guys in one marketing. We still don't have this engine built out, so we had to focus on one particular niche market, which is the employee benefits consulting space. They do tons of RFPs, and so that is where all of our emphasis is now. Kind of spinning off of that for you, Sarah, is there always the, in the as you're raising funds, whether it's, public or private, is there always the, here's what we're going to do with it, and then you go seek the funds, or is there, do you start with that, and then some decision point where you have to maybe go, okay, these funds are available, but it's not exactly what we are targeting? Sure, that's a very good question. So it, it's a mix, to be, to be fair. I, in a perfect world, I have a three-year, a five-year, a 10-year plan of funding, and I know where I need to be along those lines and how I'm gonna fill those gaps, whether it's with private funds, with public, with individual donors, with friends and family rounds, you know, desperate rounds there. That's, that's in a perfect world. So um, sometimes if I see an opportunity, I mean, I never ever um, run away from an opportunity for funding. So if I see an opportunity for funding, I'll figure out how that program, how to build a program that could be funded by it that's within our mission. Does that answer Excellent. it? Excellent, of All course. Right. Question back here. Question back to you, right? As entrepreneurs, what do you do on a regular or a daily basis to uh, take care of yourself, enjoy yourself, and maintain your sanity? You go first? I will let you go first. All right. I, I don't. I mean, <laughs> so. <laughs> My exact answer. That, to be frank, all the, the people that are entrepreneurs that say that they can maintain everything and spin all the plates, all that is total and utter crud. There is, can I say that in the coffin stage? It, life is not in balance, you will not have it all, you have to make some really, really hard choices. There are times when you ha are going to have to stay up all night coding to get a job done, or you're gonna have to miss your kid's play. Sometimes I pick the coding, I mean that's just what life is like. Startup life is not regular, normal, day-to-day -day life. It's 24 hours a day. Um, sometimes your liver gets a bit damaged. Um, sometimes it can be a bit soulless, but it's a fabulous life. Yes. <laughs> it, it's, it is that, um, yeah, oftentimes it's, it's, before this world of RFP, I, used to run marathons. I was a triathlete. Uh, I traveled around the world a number of times with my wife. These things were really important. And right now, I look at it, what I'm doing right now is just as personally fulfilling, even though it's frustrating and it's stressful. Uh, it is something that I have created. And that 
that fulfills me equal to those activities to which I did before. It, the ones from before were more personally or better than me working for 18 hours in a day. Um, and so I've, I've had to sacrifice a lot of that personal time, but the level of satisfaction and fulfillment hasn't changed in my life. A quick question for you. Are you, after you got funded, were you working more hours or less hours? To be honest, we work about the same, which is a lot. That wasn't one of the choices, uh, Steve. <laughs> I think my brain is, actually, I'm going to say it's the same. It, it, we worked just as much. If, had we not worked a massive amount of hours beforehand, we would not have gotten funding. We were already, we were already running as fast as we could for as long as we could, um, and the money... Uh, is just allowing us to run faster, longer. So I don't think it's changed our the uh, the amount of work I'm doing. The nature of it, yes. The stress level, yes. But the, the sheer volume of it is roughly the same. I agree completely with that. When we got funding, I thought life would magically be different and rainbows and butterflies would, I don't know, make my life complete. We got funding. I realized we had to double down and work harder than we did before. And it was, there was, there there's no stopping it. Uh, the question is to like, uh, hi. either one of you. <clears throat> so you're... what is the impact of bringing in a investment to your company when you didn't have one before? How much stress do they bring into the mix because they expect to make money sooner or later and get their return investment? That all depends on who you bring in. And there's no other way to say that. I don't feel our lead investor, I don't feel any extra stress from him. I put the stress on myself to perform for him, if that makes sense. So the stress is probably self-induced. He is not breathing over our shoulder. He still owns a minority stake in the company. And so even if he were to try and impose some level of, of, of oversight Dave and I could trump it. Um, so, but, but we don't. Like, we really, really value his expertise. He was a CEO here in town who has tons of industry knowledge and, and has gone through tons of experiences. So it's our job to learn how to pull that from him. And in doing so, it's all back on us, putting the stress on ourselves to try and maximize our relationship with him. It's not from him to us. I think that I agree it depends on who you pull in, but the funders that want to fund you, they're also going to be your best advocate. And so it's in their best interest to make you work as hard as possible and to help, to help you see your blind spots and to help you pivot as well. Go for it, in the um, middle there. When you're in that beginning phase and you're almost necessarily reactionary and everything is brand new, did you have strategies or ideas or advice on how to structure your day, something as simple as that, from the moment you wake up until whatever time you end, be it you know, 11 o'clock or, or midnight? How did you think about the most productive way to structure your day with no blueprint ahead of you? So I, uh, so I don't sleep very much, to be fair. And when I wake up, I wake up with a list in my head, uh, literally a list in my head of probably, probably 200, 300 things that I need to do that day. Um, the first thing I do is I look at the list that's in my head, and I look at the, uh, my real list that I keep in Asana. And if you haven't used Asana yet, it's the best project management tool ever. Um, and I, I don't own any of it. So, and I figure out what I need to triage and what I need first and what I can get to other people to do on my behalf. And that's how I start my day, is figuring out what fires need to be put out, how to triage, and what to give to other people. And then I start the day. I thought it was great that you said when you go to bed at midnight, it's mostly go to bed right around, right around 2 or 3 a.m. and wake up at 4. That's the general schedule of things. And mine's really simple. I only check emails three times a day. I check them when I wake up in the morning, I check them over lunch, and I check them before I go to bed. And that's it. And it, people, I think, get upset. Some text messages I don't respond to. I have 300 unread emails in my account because of it. But 
I do it because I can't take the distractions that come every couple minutes. So I don't, I don't even have it open, turn off all notifications. I don't get them. And it is, for me, I have to be able to have time to sit and focus. All right, we're at our end. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate your <laughs> feedback, input, information. Thanks, everybody, for coming. No. no. Sorry, we have no. a... No. 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 We actually have a quick announcement from Launch KC, if Drew wants to come up. Excellent. Yeah. Turn on the mic, please. Okay, we're good. There you go. All right, thank you. Um, March 31st, we opened a uh, application period that runs through July 2nd for the Launch KC Global Grants Competition. Uh, we are giving half a million dollars away this fall in non-dilutive grants, uh, ten fifty thousand gra ten fifty thousand dollar grants plus free office space and a whole bevy of other uh, opportunities, including a, a nice, well-rounded mentor group. Um, those applications are open. Uh, we've already seen applications from 13 different states and three different countries. Uh, we've seen some interesting uh, applications already in some specific areas. Um, here today to tell you that if you are in Kansas City, you've been an accelerator, you've been an incubator, you've, you know, you, you're, you're, you're starting up, if you will, please look at that application and apply. Uh, the, uh, the, the ending is July 2nd for the application period, and we'll actually announce the winners this fall during Tech Week. And so um, if, if you're out there and you're thinking about it, you know, it's a real shot to get some money, non-dilutive non -dilutive form of capital uh, into your business. So please do apply. Where do we apply? LaunchKC.org. Actually, uh, our, we have a really nice website. One other thing you could do that would really help us because, you know, there are folks here that, uh, that you guys know a lot of people you're networked in. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, at launch underscore KC.com or LaunchKC on Facebook. Check it out. We've got about 60 days left in the application period, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you so much. It's a really great opportunity for entrepreneurs in Kansas City. So thanks, Drew. Um, that's the end of our program today. Hope to see you guys next week. Thank you.